So welcome. Thank you all for coming out so early in the morning. Uh, and thank you to everyone from the Human Experiences and Interactions Academic Society for having me. I hope that you don't regret it. <laughs> Disney has been in the news a lot recently. Disney's always in the news. Uh, but over the last year or so, it's been in the mainstream media news a lot. Uh, the news with political implications, if you get my drift. Uh, and some of you are probably like, look, I am just here to design roller coasters or provide a great hospitality experience or to teach others how to do that. I am not here to be political, uh, but we're about to get political. Uh, but not in an awkward way, I promise. Exit. There are three of them. <laughs> we are going to talk about politics in the sense of American identity. We're going to talk about why theme parks matter greatly in terms of American identity. And specifically, we're going to talk about why the Disney theme parks matter to American identity, because that's kind of my thing. So if you're here from somewhere else, I'm sorry. Uh, but I do think that the principal argument about why Disney matters holds true for all theme spaces. Uh, particularly for those who deal in historic themes and or national symbols. In the end of this, I hope that you'll have some new perspective on why whatever function you perform or hope to perform in the theme entertainment industry, what you do and what you contribute matters. Not just within the firms of your theme space, but to all of America. So, why does what happens at Disney theme parks matter? Because Disney theme parks are one of the foremost keepers of our national narrative. A national narrative consists of the often mythical versions of American stories that illustrate the characteristics that make Americans unique and serve to affirm shared values and unite a diverse group of people under a distinctly American identity. The hardworking, pious pilgrims, the independence-loving founding fathers, fiercely self-reliant wagon trains that set up the West, etc., etc. We're talking stories in school, on television, at national moments of celebration, and their traits become who we aspire to be, believe that we have been, and define who we collectively are. It does not matter if these stories are factually correct. I can say that because I am a public historian, not a big H historian, and my research is grounded in not what happens in history, but in how people use history to make sense of and that's what a national narrative does. It takes kernels of truth from history and transforms them into stories that speak to our present identities, actual or aspirational. Disney's version of the national narrative is the version that holds sway in American collective memory. That is the memory of experiences shared by the vast majority of Americans. There are few remaining public spaces where substantial numbers of Americans gather and create shared experiences. We no longer have a town square or a dominant church, but what we do have is Disney. Studies estimate that as many as 90% of Americans visit a Disney park at some point in their lifetime. And even the Smithsonian and the National Mall, where I come from, a place that represents our official American narrative, cannot boast to reach that high. But it's not just the numbers game. To understand why Disney parks in particular, among thousands of theme spaces, including museums and historic sites, uh, have become so important to our national identity, we have to start 100 years ago, with the founding of the Walt Disney Company. Since that time, several key factors have worked in concert to transform Disney theme parks into places where the collective memory of the American narrative is shaped. So I'm going to go through these kind of quickly because I want to get to the heart of the message and also because people will be mad at me if I don't end on time. Uh, but I do think that it's important to acknowledge that there are factors beyond just being a successful theme park that gives Disney in particular this power over our national narrative. And if these next few minutes uh, aren't convincing explanation for you, you are free to read my book where my argument is laid out, and then you can argue with me on the internet like everyone else. <laughs> the first thing to know is that the Disney brand has always been identified with American folk history values. From its creation in 1923 as the Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio, the Disney operation was producing films that echoed Americans' ideal version of themselves. Often set in a nostalgic 19th century rural American heartland, these animated shorts featured a hero, most often Mickey Mouse, whose strong work ethic and bravery in the face of risk always found the little guy and common man triumphant over his foe. 
These cartoons took as source material common American folk tales that themselves had evolved around historic myths of American ideals. In fact, President Eisenhower dubbed Walt Disney America's own creator of folklore in a 1957 speech. The next important point is that Disney very quickly became a quasi-official American symbol during World War II because of the work that Disney did for the federal government in service of the war effort. While Disney's cartoons and comic strips were popular American representatives overseas from the time of their release, their use on official insignia, war bonds, and other campaigns put them very often literally alongside the American flag as symbols of the U.S. In February 1943, the New York Times went so far as to label Donald Duck a salesman of the American way. And then, of course, in 1955, Disney took the folk history and values of America that they were already identified with and translated them into a physical experience with the creation of Disneyland in California, a theme park that most of you probably know Walt Disney dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America. In 1971, the Disney Company opened Walt Disney World in Florida, expanding on the original template while maintaining the same basic cultural story. Now, in the tradition of quasi-historical places like Greenfield Village and Colonial Williamsburg, Disney parks offer an immersive experience of a carefully curated version of history, which becomes, through our experience of it, the version of history that we most readily remember. Hence, it becomes our collective memory. And one of the most important factors in the legitimization of Disney's version of the American narrative are their partnerships with the federal government and participation in national celebrations. Since Dwight Eisenhower, every president, with the exception of Lyndon Johnson, has visited a Disney property at some point in their lifetime. Four of them, Carter, Reagan, H.W. Bush, and Obama, made their visits while in office, and many others visited during their active political years. When Nixon visited in 1955, as sitting vice president, he was literally given a key to Disneyland. And I can think of no better symbol of the office of the presidency offering a seal of approval to Disney's version of the American story than that, except for maybe this classic photograph of Obama in front of Cinderella Castle. <laughs> but beyond its association with national figures, the Disney parks also celebrate national holidays, which situates them as places Americans can come together to celebrate their national identity. A great example of this legitimization is the 15-month bi-coastal extravaganza of Americana, America on Parade, which Disney staged from 1975 to 1976 to celebrate the bicentennial of the United States, and which produced one of my favorite quotes about Walt Disney from journalist Dick Shaw. After visiting both the Magic Kingdom Park in Florida and Colonial Williamsburg during the celebration, Shaw's six-year-old son intimated to his father, George Washington may be the father of his country, Dad, but Walt Disney is its guardian. So that brings us back to the idea of Disney as a keeper and a shaper of the country's history and story, which is ultimately what makes Disney Park space so important and what lands it in the news constantly. Disney's parks, as well as many others, are often inspired by history. But we all know that stories of history are not what's being told at theme spaces. History is used to tell the stories, but the stories are stories of the present. I want to bring this to you, but if you come up to Washington, D.C. and visit national monuments like the Lincoln Memorial and museums like those of the Smithsonian, that's what's happening there. All the choices that we make as storytellers, the thesis, the setting, the characters, they all give indications about what we care about today. So here's an example from my own backyard, the FDR Memorial. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the 32nd president of the United States. He was also thus far the only president to regularly use a wheelchair due to some paralysis after contracting polio. While Roosevelt's paraplegic status wasn't exactly a secret, he and his team took pains to manage the public image to mitigate any attention to his disability. Staff arranged his arrival and departure at public events to allow him to move by grabbing hold of an aid or a railing, or draped him in a blanket or cloak to cover his wheelchair while seated. This wasn't so much about hiding the truth necessarily, but about presenting a specific image that FDR wanted. A strong, capable leader whose paralysis was nothing more than a nuisance at best, and certainly not something that impacted his physical capabilities or his ability to govern. As a political storyteller, Roosevelt largely chose to leave disability out of his story. However, looking back now, it's also clear that in choosing to obscure that part of his story, Roosevelt and others sent a national message. 
a message that a person with a disability wasn't the ideal representation of the American identity. <clears throat> Reporters at the time mostly cooperated with this version of the story, to the point where it nearly went unreported that he had fallen into the orchestra pit at a 1932 political rally when it turned out that the podium he was holding on to for support was unfortunately not bolted down. Luckily, I don't need that today. Thousands of photographs were taken of FDR during his lifetime, but only four are known to exist of him in his wheelchair. And in fact, what today is common knowledge almost about FDR wasn't widely known until accessibility advocacy groups of the 60s and 70s began including it as part of their own messaging, claiming space in the American narrative. When designing a memorial for FDR in the 1970s, architect Lawrence Halprin created an extremely accessible space for present-day visitors as a nod to FDR's own mobility needs, but chose to represent the president himself only in ways in which he had let himself be seen in public <coughs> in life. Riding in a car or seated in a chair with casters that were covered by a large cloak. The building of the memorial began in 1991, only a year after the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law. By the time it officially opened in 1997, a movement had grown petitioning for FDR's disability to be made visible in the memorial. The National Park Service, who manages the site, agreed to an addition in 1998, and various groups raised $1.6 million to build it. In 2001, a statue of FDR clearly seated in his wheelchair was finally added to the memorial. But the reality is that the memorial was never about what Roosevelt wanted in the first place as so few memorials are actually about those they are erected to. Roosevelt declared in 1941 that if any memorial were created for him, it should be a simple stone block, which he did get in 1965, but which is not nearly as exciting and which almost nobody visited. <laughs> the story of the FDR memorial is partly about FDR, but it's mostly about what Americans <coughs> wanted to tell themselves about who they were when it was erected. And most importantly for this talk, it's partly about who we wanted to recognize as part of the American narrative during the 1940s, 60s, 70s, and 90s. The stories that were told by the Disneyland of 1955 weren't just about the frontier or turn of the century Main Street, but were really about a country searching for reassurance during a time when the threat of having their entire way of life erased in a nuclear war was very real. Park visitors in the 50s were very invested in an American narrative that told them, for instance, that they had overcome hostile threats before, and that America's unique brand of capitalism would give us a scientific advantage in the new frontier. But today, in the changing landscapes of the Disney parks, just like that of the National Mall, we can see the public's changing demographics and ideals making an impact on Disney's portrayal of our national narrative. We can see the very evolution of what it means to be an American. I like to talk about it as a layering of diversity of new ideas onto what already exists, both physically in the parks and structurally in America. And if you want to get really nerdy with it, you can liken it to adding planes to a multi-plane camera, allowing us to see more of the truer picture. There are a lot of examples of this, but one of my favorites is the storyline and its accompanying panels that were added to Disney World's Main Street Confectionery in 2021. The panels depict the entrance of a fictitious national baking competition taking place, one can assume, around the turn of the century based on the theming of Main Street. The bakers highlighted are a diverse group, including the first openly LGBTQ plus characters to appear at a Disney park, Saul Fitz and his partner, Gary Henderson. But of course, none of this would have actually happened. The history of this country is such that many of the minority groups represented on this side wouldn't have had the leisure time or the resources to bake for fun, nor would they have been allowed to enter many national competitions. Saul and Gary would not, in the early 1900s, likely have gone around talking openly about their partnership. But this sign isn't teaching us about the history of American small towns. What it's doing is making a statement about who Disney and their consumers are including as part of their American identity today. The title of this presentation, which I'm sure you don't Call any longer, started with the quote from journalist Jenny Avis. She called Disneyland a cartoon city upon a hill. She applied the term when she visited Disneyland in 2018 uh, to see the Viva Navidad celebrations, where she wrote that the America that she saw surrounding her at Disneyland was one that exhibited inclusion, diversity, and civility through the stories they were choosing to tell in their parade. 
and that that was the America she wanted to live in, not the one that she confronted when she left the park. Similarly, I think many people today might say that while the America that illustrated on the sweetest most panel might not be truly representative of what America was and has been in the past, it does represent an America many of them want to live in today. In his book, Vinyl Leaves, Stephen Feldman wrote, in times of stress or anxiety, people often turn to shared social institutions to provide a common moral discourse for ordering and understanding their world. And Feldman, like myself and many others, argued that it was Disney World in particular that was providing that moral discourse for many Americans. Disney parks may already represent then our cartoon cities upon a hill, our shining beacons of who we could be, but it's all of you doing the work today who get to determine what that looks like going forward. Whether you work for Disney or Thinkwell or Freckled Sky or whoever else is in the room that I did not leave out on purpose, um, <laughs> any, any themed entertainment venue that provides shared social space, uh, no matter what size your community is, your choices in this field will matter far beyond whether someone enjoys the experience you build or the hospitality that you provide. So at the risk of this sounding like some sort of graduation speech, my hope for all of you who are going out and doing this actual work is that you bring to your work a thoughtfulness about how what you're doing contributes to and in fact shapes the society that you live in long after you put your job away for the day. To those of us who study themed entertainment, my hope is that we never fall prey to the all too easy trap of thinking that this subject can be easily dismissed because it involves entertainment. Know that what happens at Disney and themed spaces like it matters. That what those things tell us today, right, is that Disney and other theme spaces have always served as a space for sort of political and moral discourse. Um, if you watch the news today, you might think that it's, it's extremely recent and no one has ever done this before, but you know, the hippies invaded Disneyland in, 19, in the 1960s to make a political statement. Right. Um, all of those things together are to me, you know, whether Disney likes them or not, the evidence that Disney is important on a national level. <coughs> uh, the fact that we deem things like the carousel of progress um, important to talk about. And there's also a really great paper, I think it's by Lynn Wiener, about the carousel of progress specifically and how it has depicted the changing roles of women over time. Uh, and you can see sort of in that ride um, the waves of feminism specifically having an impact on how women are depicted. Um, and it's not always forwards progress, right? Um, so I would also suggest reading that paper if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, hello, thank you again for your talk. This is wonderful. Um, I want to ask about a politicization of stories within Disney theme parks. Um, is this actually a thing that is occurring, or is it our interpretation of replacing um, original stories and political ideas with IP stories? Um, is this a washing out of politicism, or is it just us wanting more political stories? I think that it's so hard to separate, right, because the personal is political. So for all of us, everything that we do every day, we see through the lens of whatever our politics are. Um, when you look at the Disney parks and other physical spaces, and the sort of layering in that they're doing. What, what I see is not necessarily a changing of those original stories. Um, in a few places, they are you know, sort of uh, being replaced, such as with Splash Mountain. But um, instead, I see the same story being layered over so that more people can physically see themselves in the park. Um, we, um, at the Smithsonian, we did a, a call for photos and stories from the public. Um, and we got this really great story from an African-American family who started going to Disneyland in the 60s. And they said, um, I, I want to do them justice. Let me make sure I get this quote right. They said, when we looked around, we didn't always see people who looked like us. But we always heard Walt Disney say, to all who come to this happy place, welcome. And I think what it is is not so much a politicization as it is people just wanting to see themselves represented. And then, you know, whether the theme parks or entertainment spaces are willing to change in that way. So I think it's, it's less political and simply more um, representational. Yeah, this is 
called uh, themed experience, um, and uh, as opposed to themed entertainment. So experience says to participate. What are the particular things from the Sony point of view, the way that you're increasing that participation of that audience rather than the passive story? At the Smithsonian or at um, Anywhere specifically? Anywhere in the future for all of us to mm -hmm. invite. Mm -hmm. um, the exhibit at the Smithsonian actually has a the second half of it is about how a corporation and its visitors and the public work together to make change. Um, one section is sort of on people voting with their dollars, right? You go in, you say, I like this, I don't like that, I'm going to put my money towards this, and Disney people crunch their numbers and say this is successful and this isn't. The other is through direct protest, right? People do go stand in front of the Disney theme parks or the Smithsonian, which just had a big rally on the mall the other day, um, and say, we like this, we don't like that. With social media, that's really arisen, kind of taken off on fire, right? Um, everyone can voice their opinion um, about the Disney theme parks, but I also think um, watching the ways that the public uses the story, so we do that at the Smithsonian, right, and we see what public programs people are actually willing to participate in. We let people come to us and say, this is what we're interested in, and can do you have anything on this? Um, finding ways, especially digital, to make it a little more democratized. I think it's got to be a, a marrying of both a reaching out on the part of the people creating the experience, but also the sort of fan, the guest, the participant, whoever it is. Uh, being willing to, to stand up and, and reach back. Hi, um, I was wondering if you have thought at all about um, Disney's America, the proposed park in Virginia under Michael <coughs> Eisner, and because the you know the reason that it didn't get built is generally like a pushback from historians and the community of oh, we don't want Disney shaping our history. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious how that fits in. Well, I will also suggest that you talk to Margaret King and Jamie O'Boyle about that uh, later, because they know a lot about Disney's America. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the reasons that I started doing this work and sort of going to, you know, I go to academic conferences and talk about it, is because I think that historians who say we don't want Disney doing anything, or Disney or any themed experience, Using history in any way are being really short sighted. Uh, frankly, you know, I, I've seen the people that come to the Smithsonian, I've seen the number of people that come to Disney, and it's a vastly different number of people. And I think that, again, the lesson that you're getting when you go to a themed entertainment space as opposed to sort of a themed experience historical space uh, is more about today than the past, but at the very least, it can grab you, and if you're interested, Go, then you go read a book by a historian, right? Um, you know, I still go to Disney. I still enjoy it. I still write, you know, I criticize it, but I, I think I think it's short-sighted, right, to, to not want to at least work with companies, right, to make every product the best that it can be. Any other questions? Thank you so much, Bethany Bemis.